Hey, welcome to Draft Academy. My name is Mike. This video is part of a series of videos where I'll be going over the basic syntax of different programming languages. And one of the most annoying things about picking up a new programming language is having to learn all the syntax from scratch. In my own experience, it generally manifests in a lot of Google searching and stack overflow. For an experienced developer, the problem isn't understanding the concepts of programming, it's knowing how to implement those concepts in the new language. So things like variables, data types, data structures, loops, conditionals, and object orientation. All of these things are done a little bit differently in each programming language and having to research how to do it all can be extremely annoying and tedious. In this video, I'll go through and show you the basic syntax for the most common parts of the language. I'll give you a brief history of the language and we'll touch on some of the best practices and conventions used in that language. Now this is meant to be a quick run through. I won't be showing you how to install or configure anything and we won't really have time to learn how to do everything. You see, I've distilled it down into what I consider the core concepts. So the goal for this is to be a quick video so I can't cover every aspect of the language. With that being said, this video is meant for programmers who already understand the core concepts of programming. It's not gonna teach you any programming concepts. I'll simply show you how to do all the common things in the new language. So if you are new to programming, Draft Academy has hundreds of videos where I hold your hand and I walk you through everything you need to learn uh, to program, but this is meant for developers who already understand programming. So without further ado, let's get started. C is a general purpose, statically typed imperative programming language that was founded in 1972 by Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson at Bell Laboratories. C is a low level language, meaning it provides constructs which map efficiently to typical machine instructions. Basically, it's a more user friendly way to write low level programs. So instead of pulling your hair out writing low level code in assembly language, you can abstract a lot of the fuss and write equivalent programs in C. Because it's so low level, many operating system kernels and even other programming languages are implemented, at least in part, using C. And many modern programming languages today borrow a lot of their syntax and best practices from C. All C programs must utilize a compiler whose job is to compile the C code down into machine code readable by the computer. So anytime you want to run a C program, you have to compile it first. C relies on the user to manage the program's memory, and the syntax of C is largely influenced by the B programming language. Many developers choose to write C using a basic text editor, but there are also more specialized integrated development environments. Some of the most popular include Codeblocks, Eclipse, NetBeans, and Microsoft Visual Studio. So let's get started. I'm gonna show you guys a lot of the core concepts in C and we'll just talk about how to implement them in this language. So over here, you'll notice that I have a basic C file and I just called it app.c, so I'm using that .c extension. And this is just a basic template that we can use to write our program. So up here, I'm including two things. First is uh, STDIO, it stands for standard IO, and then STDLIB, it stands for standard lib. Those are just two things that we can use in our C program. And you'll notice they have this .h, and that stands for a header. So basically I'm including two header files into this file. And then down here I have this main function, and this is a special function in C. Basically any code that we put in here will get executed when we run our C program. So let me go ahead and show you guys a bunch of awesome stuff that we can put inside this main function to write our C programs. First thing we can look at is printing. So down here I have an example of uh, how we could print stuff out onto the console. So over here I have a console window and over here I just have my text editor. So I'm using this printf function and this printf function basically stands for print function and inside of here I can put some text. So you'll notice I'm putting hello and then I'm putting a new line character. Here I'm putting world and then I'm putting exclamation point new line character. And up here we get this output. So that's a great way to output information onto the console. We can also use variables in C. So variables are really useful for storing and keeping track of information. And variable names are case sensitive and they can begin with letters or an underscore. And then after that, we can have letters, numbers, or an underscore. And generally um, in C, you're gonna be starting your variables with a letter. And convention says to start with the lowercase word and then all additional words are capitalized. So if I had a, a variable, my first variable, it would be my first variable, just like that. You'll notice the second and third words are capitalized. A lot of people call that camel case. And now because C is a statically typed language, we have to rigorously define the types of all of our variables. So down here I have a simple char, it stands for character. And this is a single eight bit character. And over here I have like a representation of a string. So a string would be like a string of characters. And as you'll see later, this is actually an array of characters, but we can represent it inside of these open and close parentheses. And like I said, this is an array of characters. And down here we have numbers. So two basic types of numbers, uh, whole numbers and decimal numbers. So whole numbers, we call them integers. 
And there's a couple different types of integers. So we have a short, and this is like the smallest. It's at least 16 bits unsigned integer. And then we have just a normal in, and this is gonna be the default. And it's at least 16 bits signed integer, but it's not smaller than a short. And then we have a long, which is 32 bits, and a long, long, which is gonna be 64 bits. And finally down here for the floating point numbers, we have a basic float. And this is gonna be single precision floating point. We have a double, which is a double precision floating point, and then a long double, which is an extended precision floating point. And then finally, um, if you want, a lot of people will represent Boolean values. So a Boolean would be like a one bit true or false value. Um, C doesn't have a separate data type for Booleans like a lot of other languages. So generally the convention is that you'll represent it as an integer and zero is gonna be false and non-zero is gonna be true. So that's kind of how that's implemented. And you, if we want, we can modify variables. So I could say like test grade is equal to F. I could also create a constant. So if I wanted, um, I could put the const modifier right there. So I could say const int. And generally when you do this, um, you'll make the variable all caps. So I could change this to is tall. And that's not 100% necessary to make this caps. That's just kind of a convention. But a constant is not gonna be able to be modified. And then finally down here, I'm showing you guys how you can print out a variable and interweave it into a string. So if we wanna print out a variable, we can use this printf function. And any place I wanna print a variable, I can put inside of these quotation marks a percent and then a specific character. And this is basically gonna act as a placeholder for the variable that we wanna print out. So percent %s is gonna stand for string. So you'll see I'm printing out percent %s and then percent %c over here. And then over here I can pass in those values. So this is gonna get placed over here and this is gonna get placed over here. And you can see it says, Mike, your grade is F. So it's using those variables to print that out. And down here, I have a full listing of all of these uh, percent characters. So percent C and percent D, E, F, I, O, et cetera. So all of these are gonna allow you to print out different data types. We can also do something called casting. So casting is basically like converting one value into another, so changing the data type of something. So I could cast this floating point number as an integer, and I can just put int in parentheses right here, and then the number after it. I could do the same as it for a double. So here I have three divided by two, but I could cast this three into a 3.0, and that will give me a uh, 1.5. So I'm able to change the 3.14 into a three, and three divided by two, which would normally just be one into 1.5. Now I wanna talk to you guys about pointers, and a pointer is basically just a type of data that we can represent in our C programs. So a pointer is basically just a memory address. So a pointer is another word for a memory address, and a lot of times in C, since it's such a low-level programming language, we're gonna wanna be uh, you know, working with the actual uh, memory address of the different variables that we create. So down here I have a variable, it's an integer called num, and I set it equal to 10. And if I want, I can print out the memory address, or I can print out the pointer of this variable. So down here I use this ampersand as a prefix to the variable name, and what that does is it tells C to print out the memory address. So you'll see over here we have this hexadecimal number, and this is the memory address of that num variable. And down here, if you want, you can actually store those pointers inside a variable. So just like I could store an integer or a double in a variable, I could also store a pointer in a variable. So here I'm creating the pointer variable. I'm just saying int star, and then I'm naming it. And one naming convention is usually to put lowercase p before the name of the pointer and then I'm storing the memory address of the num variable. Now the reason that I put int right here is because num is an int. So if I'm storing the pointer to an integer variable, then I'm gonna set the pointers variable as an int. And then if you want, I could just print out pnum like I did down here, so that prints out the pointer. And you can do something called dereferencing a pointer. And dereferencing a pointer basically means that you're gonna go to that memory address and actually get the actual value. So remember, pnum is a memory address, but if I come down here and I put this star here and then I say pnum, this is dereferencing it. So now it's gonna actually give us the value stored at that memory address, which is gonna be this 10. So pointers are a big topic, um, but this kind of gives you a, a quick overview of what they are. All right, so now let's take a look at numbers. So numbers are really useful. It's one of the most popular data types in any programming language. So I'm gonna show you guys how we can do some basic uh, number stuff. So over here I have like two times three, and you'll see over here we're printing out six. So you can multiply numbers, you could add numbers together, subtract, divide, and multiply numbers, all the basic arithmetic operations. You can also use the modulus operator, and the modulus operator will give you the remainder of a division. So if I say 10, mod three, this is gonna take 10 divided by three, which is gonna be three with a remainder of one, and it's gonna give us that one back. So it'll give us the remainder. Um, you can also specify order of operations. So I have this little equation right here, one plus two times three, 
And by default, C is gonna multiply two times three first, so it'll be six, and then it'll add one, so we'll get seven, which we do over here. But if I wanted to do the addition first, I could just put parentheses around it, and now that'll change the order of operations. So when I run my program again, now we're getting nine instead of getting seven because it's gonna be three times three, which is gonna be seven. And I also wanna show you guys how ints and doubles interact, so how whole numbers and floating point numbers interact. Um, you'll see here I have 10, which is an integer, divided by three, which is a floating point number. And whenever you do an integer uh, and do a math operation with a floating point number, you're always gonna get a floating point number back. So I got a decimal back here, 3.3 .3 repeated. But if I was gonna make this an integer now, so I could change this 3.0 to a three, and then I'm also gonna have to modify this. So instead of saying percent %f, which stands for a floating point, I wanna print out a percent %d, which is gonna be an integer. And now you'll see that we're getting an integer back. So anytime you do math with two floating points or a floating point and an integer, you're always gonna get a floating point back or anytime you do math with two integers, you're gonna get an integer back, and that's kind of how it works. So down here, there's a couple other things we can do. I had created this variable called num. I gave it a value of 10. I can say num plus equals 100, and what that's gonna do is it's gonna add 100 to num and store it inside of num. So you see over here now, we get 110 when I print out num, and that's because num plus equals 100 basically gave us 110. We can also use this increments operator, this plus plus down here. Basically what that'll do is it'll increment an integer. So I can say um, num plus plus, and then when we print it out, you'll see we get 111. And that's because we added one to num. You could also do minus minus and that'll decrement it. So that's kind of uh, basically how you can do stuff with numbers. All right, so now let's take a look at getting input from the user. So if I want to actually get input from the user into my program, I can do it like this. First thing you always wanna do is uh, create a variable where we can store whatever the user inputs. So in my case, I'm creating a string, which is just, a, like I said, an array of characters. So I say char name, and then I gave it 10 right here. That basically defines how big this string is gonna be. So how many characters the string can hold. And down here, I'm just printing out a prompt. So I'm printing out enter your name, which you can see is printing out over here. Then when I wanna get the input from the user, let's say I wanted to get a piece of text from the user. I can use this fgets function, and inside of here I can pass in three things. So the first thing I wanna pass in is the variable where I wanna store whatever the user inputs. So it's gonna be name, because that's the variable we created up here. Then you're gonna specify a buffer limit. This is basically like how many characters you're gonna allow the user to enter. Um, and this protects you because you don't want the user to be able to enter in like, you know, a million characters or something and crash your program. So this will protect you from that. And then STDIN stands for standard input. That basically just means this guy over here, so the terminal, it's basically telling us where we wanna get the information from. And then that'll get the information and then I'm just printing it out. So over here, if I typed in my name, it says enter name, type in Mike. You see it says, hello Mike. So it's saying hi to the user. That's one way we can get a string, but if you wanna get other data types, um, I'll show you guys how to do that. So down here I have another one and this is gonna allow us to get a number. So it says int age, enter your age. So I can enter in my age here. So let's say like 30 and it'll tell me I'm 30. But you'll notice when I get an integer from the user, I don't use this fgets function, I'm using scanf. And there's a couple of different ways that you could get uh, integers. This is one popular way. So I'm saying scanf and then inside of these quotation marks, I'm specifying uh, the type of information that I wanna get. So I'm saying percent %d because I wanna get an integer. And then over here, I'm passing in the name of the variable. I'm actually passing a pointer to the variable. So I'm saying ampersand age. So this is the variable where I wanna store it. I need to pass that pointer into there and then it'll go ahead and tell me how old I am. And you can do the same thing for doubles and for characters. So down here, I'm showing you guys how we could get a character. Similar, I'm printing out the prompt, enter your grade, and then I'm using scanf, but this time instead of percent %d, I'm using percent %c, and again, passing in the pointer to the variable where I wanna store it. And then finally, I can come down here and do the same thing for a double. So again, printing out the prompt, and then over here for a double, instead of just saying f, we're gonna say lf, and then again, pass in that pointer. Um, so one thing to notice is when you're using scanf to get a double, you're using lf up here, but to print it out, you just use a normal f. So that's kind of how you can get uh, input from the user. And again, it's not the only way, but it's a pretty good way to do it. All right, now let's talk about arrays. So arrays is a, a structure where we can store multiple values. And the way we create arrays in C is actually pretty similar to how we create variables. So I'm just gonna define the data type that I wanna store, give it a name, and then after the name, I'm gonna make an open and close square brackets. And that'll tell C that we wanna create an array. The first thing you can do is just assign this some individual values. 
So I could give this values up front, like four, eight, 15, 16, et cetera. And each of these are gonna have indexes. So we would say that this four is at index position zero, eight's at index position one, et cetera. So uh, index positions are always gonna start at zero and that's pretty standard across programming languages. And down here, I could actually modify or access an individual element. So to access the element, I can just say the name of the array and then inside of square brackets, specify the index of the particular element that I wanna access. So in this case, we're accessing the zeroth element, that four, and I can set it equal to something like that. And then down here, I'm printing out zero and one. So we're printing out 90 and then eight because eight's right there. Another thing you can do is um, just declare the variable without giving it any information. So I could say like int lucky numbers six. And what this is gonna do is it's basically gonna create the variable, but it's not gonna give it any information up front. So then I could come down here and do stuff like this and populate the uh, array. But we have to put this number here, basically telling C how big we want the array to be. So over here, I'm creating an array that would have uh, six slots. So I could store six things inside of it. And it's important that you specify that up front. You can also specify the same thing in here. So I could come down here to this one and give this a value and also give it some initial values. In addition to single arrays, you can also specify n dimensional arrays. So these would be like two or three or four dimensional arrays. Over here, I have a two dimensional array, just kind of show you guys how it works. Um, so again, this one's called number grid. And over here, since it's two dimensions, I have uh, two of these open and closed square brackets. And then over here, I'm giving this some initial information. So this first number over here specifies how many elements are gonna be in the array. And then this second number specifies how many elements are gonna be in each element. So remember, since each element is an array, we need to specify the second number. So I have two elements, and in each one of those elements, I have three elements. And then if I wanna access a specific element, I can just access the uh, high level element here, and then the element within that element over here. So you'll see down here, I'm printing out zero, zero and zero one. We get a one here because it's accessing this and we get a 99 here because I modified that to be 99. And this same, you know, kind of formula can apply to, like I said, n dimensional arrays. So three or four or five, uh, it doesn't really matter. Again, just like normal arrays, if you don't know what you want to have in there initially like this, you can just sort of declare it and then um, insert the values as you go. All right, now let's talk about functions. So functional programming is a really important concept. Basically it allows us to store specific blocks of code in their own little containers and then we can call those blocks of code uh, repeatedly throughout our programs. And so over here, I actually created a function. So by default, like I said, we have this main function and this is a special function. It's a function that's gonna get executed when we first run our C program, but you can create other functions. Like I created one up here, it's called add numbers. Basic structure is a return type. So you need to specify um, what type of information the function is gonna return. If you want, you can say void and that just means it's not gonna return anything. In my case, I'm returning an integer. And then over here, we give it a name, like add numbers. And then inside of the parentheses, I can specify parameters. So like num1 and num2, these are both integers. And then down here, I'm returning num1 and num2. And this return keyword will basically break you out of the function and return anything over here on the right. So you'll see down here, I'm creating a variable called sum. I'm setting it equal to the value of calling add numbers on four and 60. So that adds four and 60 together, stores it inside the sum variable and then prints it out. So you can see over here, we get 64. Now, one thing to note is that if I was to take this function and I was to declare it below the main function, what I'm gonna have to do is actually put a method stub up here above the main function. So if I want to have the add numbers function come after this main function, I'm just gonna need to put like a method header, basically just like specifying what this method is. That way the main function knows about it um, when it has to go and execute it. But this is only necessary if again, you're declaring this below the actual main function. All right, now let's take a look at conditionals. So uh, in this case, we're looking at if statements and if statement, you know, it just allows you to respond to different situations in your programs. So over here, I have two integers, uh, is student and is smart. And I'm basically treating these uh, kind of like Booleans. So what I can do over here is I can just say if is student is not equal to zero and is student is not equal to smart. And again, like I said before, generally you could represent like a Boolean true or false. Zero would mean false and not zero would be true. So down here, I'm basically checking to see if they're a student and if they're smart. And I can use this and operator to check more than one condition. I could also use the or operator with two vertical bars, just like that. So I can check if, I could also do else if, and that'll allow me to check another condition. And then obviously we can use else just uh, to handle when both of these conditions are false. 
Down here, we can do comparisons as well. So I can make a comparison, like I could say if one is greater than three. Now this is obviously false, but if I made it true, now you'll see that this code is gonna go ahead and get executed. So it says number comparison was true. And the different comparison operators are greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than, equal to, not equal to, and equal to. And also forgot to mention, up here the negation operator is this exclamation point. So that'll basically negate something. So if I say not equals something, it's basically just like negation. All right, and then finally we can compare characters as well. So I can compare these characters. You can compare them with greater than or less than um, as well. It's gonna be an alphabetical comparison, but you could also check for equality with like a double equals just like that. Another type of conditional that we can look at is a switch statement. So unlike an if statement, a switch statement has a more specific purpose. Basically the switch statement will allow us to check one value against a bunch of other values. So over here I have a character, it's called my grade, it's equal to A, and I can make this switch statement. So I can just say switch inside parentheses, my grade, so I'm passing in this variable. And now I can define different cases. And if these cases are true, then we'll do certain things. So in the case that my grade is equal to A, we'll print you pass and then we'll break. And that break is useful because that break will break you out of the switch statement. So in the case that it's A or it's F, we're gonna send them a message. And then we also have this default statement down here, which will basically run when none of those cases are true. So if I put an F here and I ran my program, it'll tell me that I fail. If I put a Z here, that's not a valid grade, so it'll tell me that, it'll say invalid grade. And switch statements can come in handy in very specific situations. Now let's talk about while loops and more specifically just looping in general. So a while loop is a structure where you're gonna keep looping over a block of code and executing it as long as a specific condition is true. And over here I have an integer called index and I just said equal to one and I'm gonna keep looping while index is less than or equal to five. And then every time through the loop, I'm just printing out the index and I'm incrementing it. So you can see over here, we're printing out one through five. And this is pretty standard. In a C while loop, we're always gonna check the condition first before we execute all this code. One thing you wanna watch out for is infinite loops. So if I was to get rid of this index line, now this will be an infinite loop because this condition is never gonna be false. So you just wanna watch out for that. Um, another type of loop that we can use in C is going to be a do while loop. So down here, you'll see I defined a do while loop. And this is essentially doing the same thing, except it's gonna execute the loop body before it checks the condition. So even if I set index up here equal to six, I'm still gonna be able to execute one iteration of that loop body, as you can see, um, because this condition gets checked after you execute the loop body. So in a do while loop, you execute the body, then you check the condition. In a while loop, you check the condition, and then you execute the loop body. We also have a more specialized type of loop. So a while loop is a very general loop, um, but we have a for loop and a for loop is useful in a situation where you wanna have a variable uh, that you're gonna be either you know changing or incrementing every time you go through the loop. So over here I have a for loop and I'm gonna put three things inside of these parentheses. First is a variable declaration and instantiation. So I'm declaring int i is equal to zero and i is the overwhelming uh, convention. You always wanna name your looping variable i. And then i is less than five, and I'm separating these with uh, semicolons. i is less than five, this is the loop condition or the loop guard. And then over here is a line of code that's gonna get executed after every iteration of the loop. So i plus plus. And you'll see we're printing out zero through four. We're going through the loop five times. Last thing I wanna show you guys in C is a struct. And a struct is, uh, it's kind of like a dictionary or like a, an object. Um, except it's not associated with a class. C is an object oriented. So this is just like a basic object. And you'll see over here, uh, I just say struct, and this is outside of this main function, by the way. I can just say struct and I'll give it a name. And a lot of times people will name these with capital letters. And then in here I can define uh, different attributes for this struct. So I have this student struct and it has an age, uh, a GPA and a grade. So this is maybe like allow me to represent a student inside of my program, right? And so I can kind of define this basic template for what the struct is. And then down here I can create it. So I can say struct student. So this is the name of the struct and then I give it an actual name. And then here I can assign values. So I could say like student1.age is equal to 19. Student1.gpa is equal to 3.4. I can populate the struct with different pieces of information and then I can access them. So down here you see I'm printing out student1.age. What's cool about structs is I could create, I could basically represent like different uh, 
multiple students inside of my program. I mean, essentially a struct is like a, a custom data type, right? You're creating your own like student data type. But if you're familiar with like objects in other languages, structs are very similar. It's just that C doesn't have the concept of a class. It doesn't have object orientation. This is kind of as close as you can get to uh, something like that. But structs are really useful and, you know, because C is so low level, it's actually great that you have something like this to use. So yeah, that's kind of just a broad overview of a lot of the different things you can do in C. Now I'm, you know, barely scratching the surface. I mean, there's tons more stuff that we could get into and we could do, but for the purposes of this tutorial, I think that kind of gives you guys a basic idea of how things work in C at least a little bit. And hopefully that kind of demystifies it a little bit. And now you can go off and really start mastering the C programming language. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe to Draft Academy to be the first to know when we release new content. Also, we're always looking to improve, so if you have any constructive criticism or questions or anything, leave a comment below. Finally, if you're enjoying Draft Academy and you want to help us grow, head over to draftacademy.com forward slash contribute and invest in our future.